On Saturday, November 9th, you can watch a live Notebook on Cities and Culture conversation at the New Urbanism Film Festival at Los Angeles' Acme Theater. The festival, which runs from November 7th to the 10th, moves the conversation about urban planning out of the textbook, beyond the council chambers, and into the movie theater. For more details on the full schedule, visit newurbanismfilmfestival.com. Season 4 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture, online at polarinertia.com, and Medivate, a community and set of tools to help you build the kind of meditation practice you'd like to have, online at medivate.com. Time and energy do you have to burn in an average, say, month explaining that you're not the Tom Cruise character from Magnolia? Oh, uh, that's one of the most common things. So people that come to the Art of Charmer that call, they've read the website, they might get it, they might have listened to the podcast, the pickup podcast, the Art of Charm podcast, and they might be like, oh, you come at dating and social dynamics from a positive angle. But if I'm out with friends and I'm at a dinner party or something, some somebody, usually uh, like a middle-aged divorced woman or something, will be like, oh, well, you're just like that guy from that thing. Or some guy who's like, oh, yeah, you're like that guy from that thing. And he's more like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But usually within just a few moments, it's like completely dispelled. Um, reason being, one, I like to think I don't come across that way. And two, the things that we talk about and teach are all so positive that most of the time we don't fall back on any mantra that might be resembling <laughs> resemble what, what was in Magnolia. You don't so, come out to the speak Zara, Zara, Zarathustra and, you know, hold your arms up like he does. It's, it's a mental image you just can't get rid of once you see that movie, can you? Right, yeah, exactly. Yes. When he comes out as, like, the pseudo Tony Robbins, but, like, <laughs> cult version. Yes. And uh, I just remember that one scene where he, like, rolls backwards and puts his pants on or something. <laughs> yes. And he's, like, in his underwear. That was so weird. And, and, so, and he, when I looked at that, I thought, that doesn't make any sense. Nobody does that. But having been in this industry and then being surrounded by all these weird pickup artist guys i'm like oh no that kind of chucks out <laughs> they're they're most of the guys who are in that industry who are seeking to brand themselves as like some guy with a code name that like you know puts down women in order to get men their power back usually those guys are exactly that type of guy that like dresses up in a weird costume and tries to be superhuman you know on tv it is Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, coming to you from Hollywood, where I'm speaking with Jordan Harbinger. He is a lawyer-turned-social dynamics expert. He runs The Art of Charm, which we've just started talking about. He also does the Pickup Podcast, and he, he's done many other things in life and continues to do more. We'll touch on as many of them as possible. What does The Art of Charm teach men, Jordan? So, what we teach here is confidence, plain and simple. And... Any guy that's asked girls, even his sister or mom, what, what's attractive, they're always like, confidence. But the problem is, that's kind of like saying, oh, and also be taller, <laughs> right? So guys go, okay, be confident, got it. And, and that doesn't mean anything. So what we teach is a combination of, well, essentially what we teach is emotional intelligence. Uh, and a, we teach it in a logical process that anybody can learn and master. Mm -hmm. So something that most people think other people are born with is what we teach here. Because it, it, it's scientifically proven that you're not born charismatic. It is a skill set that can be taught. Mm -hmm. It's just that those of us that are quote-unquote naturally charismatic, we learn that through an environment that's conducive to that or a set of circumstances that's conduce, conducive to that in our junior years. Um, and those people have a distinct advantage in life because they are used to getting what they want. They know how to get what they want by being persuasive, charismatic, and confident. So that's the guy that grew up where you liked him, but you hated that you liked him because he got all the girls and he was popular and he was also somehow nice and good at sports. And you thought, what's this guy's deal? Where's his, you know, I want to be his friend, but I also just want him to like go away. Um, and so we teach guys to essentially master the skill set to become not just that guy but better because you actually know what you're doing you don't just go i get what i want all the time because the problem with the naturals is when they start to hit hard times they don't know how to correct the problem because they've just sort of had everything quote unquote fall on their plate mm. um but here you can learn skill sets to become more attractive become more persuasive 
become more charismatic, learn how to network for business, develop relationships with women, develop relationships with other men, develop relationships for business. And that's what makes somebody successful in their life. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a really broad, but really, really niche skill set. So we get a lot of like entrepreneurs, Navy SEALs, you know, uh, military intelligence guys. Um, I think a Navy SEAL have nothing to worry about. Well, you would think so, but the thing is, these guys, they, they have no fear of Taliban you know, guys because they're like, oh, I can shoot a moving target at a thousand yards. But then when it comes down to this five foot five woman who they, they basically has the power to crush his ego in the palm of her hand, he goes, hey, I'm not touching that. Mm. So everybody's got things that they're afraid of. I mean, it's just like the guy who might be fearless with the opposite sex. You wouldn't say, gee. That's weird. He was scared when I started shooting at him. Oh, yeah. You know, like you would go, of course he's scared. Mm -hmm. But the Navy SEAL is used to being shot at. He's used to having people chase him through the desert mm -hmm. um, and lob mortars at him while he's sleeping in a tent. Mm -hmm. But he's definitely not used to having somebody who could crush his delicate ego. Mm -hmm. I mean, so everybody's got their Achilles heel. It almost is an issue of like muscle memory. You're like, well, how can this guy do that? Whether it is approaching a woman or whether it is running from the running from Taliban bullets well, because he's done it a bunch of times. Like, it's just that simple. He's done it a lot. That's why he can do it now. Well, that and he, more, moreover, he's trained to do it. Right. So, like, you don't join the army and go, hey, listen, I'm really good at running from Taliban bullets, and whenever I've had mortars lobbed at me here in San Francisco or L.A. or Detroit, well, Detroit, that might yeah. actually happen, but Manhattan or wherever you're from, they, they don't go, oh, okay, great, good thing you have experience doing that. So... We take guys who don't have experience and we train them just as the military would take somebody with no experience, give you the right mindsets and training to do it. So there's experience, yes, but moreover, there's mindsets and training that contribute to success in any field. So it's, it's almost like any kind of sport or uh, any kind of skill set at all. You go and you learn how to do it and then you go out and practice and you get good at it and then you go, oh. I'm confident in this area because I've done it before and it's worked out for me. Mm -hmm. To put it bluntly, do you think our generation of men is more socially inept, less socially adept than previous generations? It's hard to say because I've only lived in one generation, but um, I would say that we're definitely lacking in a lot of areas and, and the reason is mostly because we have a lot of things distracting us. I'm not going to say like, our generation is pussified, you know, like these a lot damn of kids. What's that? These Those, damn kids. Yeah, these damn kids, these little whippersnappers don't know how to do anything. I mean, some of that's true and some of it is Gen Y entitlement just totally messing us up. Right. But a lot of it is, hey, uh, when you were born in 1950, you had to go out and play with other kids. Why? Because that was all there was to do. <laughs> yes. Right? You didn't have internet and World of Warcraft and the ability right. to stay in your basement. And your mom probably had a bunch of kids because people had multiple kids because you could get a job out of high school and use it to buy a house. Right. Now people go, oh, I grew up as an only child because my parents only had one and a half incomes because my mom was only part time. And, you know, we lived in a giant city in an apartment that could only hold three people. And even then we were bursting at the seams. And then I played World of Warcraft because we got a computer because my dad was a computer scientist. So I had never really interacted with anybody else. And that's a lot of people's story. And then they went to college and they were told to work hard because their parents were immigrants, so they didn't socialize that much. And then they moved to another country or they grew up in another culture. And then when it came time to date and do normal, quote unquote, American things, they went, wait, hold on. I don't know how to do this. And my right. parents never had to. Right, right, right. There's, so. there's no rules for this. I don't know what the specific hard edged rules are like I would know in World of Warcraft or anything else I've been doing the last 20 years. Right, exactly. And, you know, a lot of times we look at role models for for advice and we look at our parents and you go, how did you guys meet? And they go, uh, we met in school and it was normal to get married at 23. Or if your parents are from India, you go, oh, well, their parents introduced them through their grandparents and that's how that worked out. Mm. Um, and if you're, you know, from an, any other culture, there's another way that is not applicable to what you're doing now. Mm. And even if it is something where your parents met at a party because you're a normal, regular old American guy through and through, you might go, well, wait a minute, I worked really hard in college, I didn't do a lot of partying, or I met a girl at a party and then we got divorced, now what do I do, right? right? So we're in a totally different bucket, um, and there's a lot of other factors pulling us in different directions. Mm -hmm. And so when we go, okay, well, what we need to do is be attractive, 
it becomes tough. And additionally, in addition to all of these other factors, now women can go, women have the option of going, wait a minute, I don't need to choose a guy who's a total schlep that I need to take care of. I have a job, I have a career, I can take care of myself. Whereas 50 years ago or 40 years ago or 30 years ago, women had to get married because they didn't really have all those other options that they do now. So they might marry somebody where they go, well, it's kind of a bummer I've got to put up with his crap, but I'm going to deal with it anyway. Now women go, to heck with this. I got my own stuff going on. So in order to get a quality woman, you need to be 10 times the quality of man you would have had to be in 1960. And that's what we teach at the Art of Charm. Now, we mentioned the pickup artist dudes who had a boom a few years back that you explained that you're not, and you know them and their non-working strategies. Do you think their mistake is or the mistake of those who follow them is separating the dating stuff from the rest of the social interaction of the human experience, like that dating is a separate game and that everything else you do with other people is is a completely different thing. Do you know what I mean? I think I might. I mean, what a lot of the pickup artist guys do, and one of the reasons that they're so unpleasant is, uh, and you can hear all the atmosphere of Hollywood Boulevard here in the background, so... Um, is this is literally the busiest block in LA. And it's kind of funny that we were just like, hey, let's record right here. Right. Um, but hey, n cities, you know, they're, this, is what they, this is what they do. Um, one of the reasons that the pickup guys are so unpleasant is because they go, instead of going, hmm, there's this skill set that everybody uses to, to generate rapport and trust with one another. And it's what makes you a charismatic, fun, entertaining person to be around. And it's what everybody loves about each other. And they go, yeah, to heck with that. How do I shortcut slash hack people's nervous system or like their buttons and triggers to get them to think one thing for just long enough for me to get in their pants right. because that's all I care about so that I can brag about it on the internet, mm -hmm. right? Sure. And so they do this and it's gross and it doesn't lead them anywhere positive either. Mm -hmm. So what they end up doing and one of the reasons that once guys go through that community and get jaded and come back out the other side so bitter and angry is because instead of learning how to be a better, more confident person and then going, wow, I'm really glad I made that transformation. It's really panned out for me with my friendships, my family relationships, and my work life. They go, wow, I have a whole bunch of women that hate me. My friends think I'm a total D-bag and I really feel bad about myself. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to get here. Mm -hmm. So now, instead of just being a lonely nerd who played Warcraft all day, now I'm a lonely nerd who plays with women all day and actually hurts people's feelings. Mm -hmm. So that's where this pickup artist thing has really failed men. Mm -hmm. um, it started off as a like a positive movement where guys could really get empowered and sort of really sort of play on equal footing and learn how to improve themselves. And then it sort of turned into, I'm angry at the world. Here's a skill set that'll make me feel better temporarily. Oh, wait, right. that didn't work. Now I'm angry again. Right. It's a form of revenge almost. And that's, that's what appeals. I mean, I, I would imagine here on Hollywood Boulevard, there's more than our fair share of guys roaming the street looking for their looking for their hack, right? Right here, Hollywood specifically, do you think that's true disproportionately? Yeah, I think a lot of people here, and one of the reasons that the quote-unquote pickup artist movement is so strong here is because there's a lot of people who are, quite frankly, again, Gen Y entitlement, looking for an easy way out, looking for some sort of easy power. And this whole area specifically is jam-packed with women that are probably going to be a prime target for something that targets women with low self-esteem because yeah. it's Hollywood. I guess if you if you walk down these blocks, I don't know, 11, 12, you, you see both of these crowds. I mean, when you're seeing specifically the guys you know are, are going astray, what's what's the tell to you? How do they, what gives them away that these are, these are guys going down the wrong road, socially speaking? Um, one of the things that's really obvious about like the pickup artist guys versus the guys that are looking for self-improvement in a healthy way is guys who are looking for self-improvement in a healthy way are always measuring things against themselves. They're always looking for ways to learn from other people. Pickup artists and other guys like that are looking to impress other people. And they're always looking for ways to make you think that they're cool. Oh, I see. And it's really, it's what we call approval seeking behavior. Oh. And it's it's ironically one of the things that they choose. This is the guy who's always trying to. Sorry, the, the guy who's always trying to like arm wrestle, right? Yeah. Who comes back to that one thing and like, hey, let, let, let's arm wrestle. Come on, come on. Exactly. So, for example, you said, "Oh, I'm going to Copenhagen soon," and you know, I just came from here and there and this other place, and I'm like, "Wow, that's really cool. How did you fund that?" 
you know, you, I, I'm getting your story. I was interested right. in it. Right. Um, and and that that's very natural for somebody to be interested in other people. Right. Um, a pickup guy might go, oh, yeah, you know, I've already been there, man. You know, <laughs> like, I... I slept with a bunch of girls from all those places and like, yeah, you know, but you should go here. This other place that you haven't been, oh my god, it's so much better. Yeah, so that, you know, in my mind I'm just like, oh, those guys. I'd never heard them described before, but you've clarified it. I mean, or they'd be like, ah, oh, that, if they can't summon that story, they'd be like, ah, oh, that place sucks, I heard. Don't go there. And then they just go on to an irrelevant story. But, you know, that sense of wanting to learn from other people, I, I want to put this in a way that's not just complimenting us, but I think both of us, through what we do, have kind of internalized or operate, started operating on the d desire to figure out what we can learn from other people. You meet somebody, you think, what can I learn from them? Which sounds maybe a little bit self-serving, but I do say that to myself. Like, what can I learn from this person? But it's not... It's not that selfish, right? Ultimately, not not like please please validate this, but is that the way you think as well? Yeah, I mean, it's different when you say what can I get from this person. For example, um, I said what can I learn, not what can I get. So we're making that distinction, listeners. Yeah, exactly. Um, a lot of people say what can I get from this person. Like for example, uh, I'm getting exposure from your podcast. That's great, but I'm not like okay, great. Now go home, <laughs> right? Um, it's it's more like huh, okay. You funded something on Kickstarter. That's really interesting. Um, you've got this really interesting business model that I want to learn more about. You've obviously got great taste in podcast guests. So <laughs> kind of figure out, you know, who else has been on your show and learn, you know, a little bit more about that. But I also kind of like to get inside people's minds. And that's what my podcast does is get inside right. people's minds who are very smart and do really interesting things in the social dynamics field and, and tangential fields. So it's normal to learn. What's in it for me is all that's human nature, right. right? The difference is, are you doing what's in it for me to heck with everybody else? Or are you doing what's in it for me? Oh, look, also, I can share this with other people. Right. And, and I'm not going to pretend to be altruistic. My podcast sells the training that we do at the Art of Charm. But the right. thing is, it does it by giving away so much value that people go, oh, my gosh, I just can't get enough of this. I want more. Mm -hmm. As opposed to going, hey, if you want the real deal, pay ninety nine ninety five to this yeah. secret P.O. box. You know, if you stop in the middle of the show, if you want the rest, cough it up. Exactly right. So if you give away a ton of value, people will come back for more. The the scammer, the what's in it for me, the the how do I get things from other people? They're always operating from what I call scarcity mentality, and what that means is there's not enough out there. I need to get it before other people get it, or it's not going to be there. Right. Um, at the Art of Charm, what we like to do is teach people, to, and what we do actually in practice is operate from an abundance mentality, which is, hey, there's so much of this that I just want to give you tons and then you'll come back for the stuff that there's value in for you, and that's good for both of us. Um, whereas, again, you know, the people that operate from that scarcity are kind of like, oh, I can't give away all my good stuff. Right. Um, if I give away all my good stuff, I'm going to run out. <laughs> and, and the problem is you, you don't run out. So by withholding, all you're doing is saying, hey, listen, uh, you're broadcasting, hey, listen, I don't really have that much. Yeah, yeah so if you, want, if you want the meager remains of what I've been holding back, right. where's your credit card number? Yeah, exactly. Now... I want to get a sense, we should give the listener the sense as well from your, from your backstory. Your podcast came first and then The Art of Charm, right? You were podcasting uh, about social dynamics and maybe a little your working definition of that as well. But what got you to the point where you were podcasting about the thing we we're calling social dynamics? Sure. Um, so we started the podcast, me and my business partners or my co-host, AJ, in his friend's basement. And we didn't even have our own basement, right? We were just law students. Or I was a law student. He was a grad student studying cancer biology. So he's a scientist. So he has, like, this scientific method. And I have all these critical thinking skills, right? And he's really great with girls, and I'm really great with uh, critical thinking skills. <laughs> so so um, our powers combined. Yes, exactly. So it was kind of like, all right, let's learn about this cool process. And, and so... We started networking, and, and I started doing this because I knew that the lawyers who made the most money since I was in law school, the lawyers who made the most money were the guys who learned how to network really well and bring in business. So I started learning how to network, and that got parlayed into learning how to meet and attract women. So it actually came the other way. And then we started the podcast thinking, okay, this is a cool thing. It's fun. 
We can do it over a couple of drinks. It's a good time. And it started to get really popular. And then what happened there, speaking of value first and abundance mentality, what happened was when we put that online, people were emailing us and going, hey, I want to learn from you. And we're like, oh, well, we're not coaches. And they're like, no, trust me, I've had coaching. These guys don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Especially when the pickup artist thing was in full swing. We were we were still, um, we came out before this book, The Game, which is right. one of the things that really popularized the pickup artist movement. Right. So since we were around before that, people were like, hey, have you heard about this book? And that was blowing up the industry, but people were going, oh, that was cool, but these guys are really weird. I don't like it. Right, so they right. were looking for alternatives, and they would find us and go, oh, you're like the white hat version <laughs> of these pickup guys. And sure. we're like, sure, maybe. So they would call us, and they'd be, we had guys who were like wealthy bankers and entrepreneurs and guys who were like light years ahead of us professionally going, listen, I want to give you guys a 100 or so dollars an hour bounce some things off of you, and then they would use these ideas that we were teaching, go out and make millions of dollars bringing in business for their companies, right. come back and be like, I want to hire you guys, but I, do, I can't even tell you guys, I, like, I can't bring you guys to my corporation and be like, hire these two kids with no work experience to teach our whole sales right. force. Right. Trust me on this one. Right. So they would do it covertly and they'd right. be like, listen, I'm going to give you guys a few grand. Just give me some ideas on how to do this. So we were phone coaching. And I remember it was funny because AJ one day comes back from working at his cancer lab and I'm laying on the hammock quote unquote studying for the bar exam but I'm doing a call with a guy in Denmark who's hiring us to help him assimilate to Danish society after a move there from Africa Wow! and we're like totally flying by the seat of our pants how many dimensions of unknowns are in that equation my god like I've never immigrated from Africa and I've never even been to Denmark but right. he was like hey the, the, and I was like listen man if this stuff doesn't work tell me I'll give you your money back and he's right. like this stuff is amazing he's like all the stuff you're telling me, all the drills you're giving me are helping me out tremendously. And I was thinking, okay, you know, I'm, t I'm, I'm teaching this guy a few things here and there, but like, what if I actually learned how to coach? Right. So we started learning how to do that. We started interviewing all these amazing experts, really stepping our, our, our methodology up and creating a curriculum that later became the foundation for the boot camp. This is, you know, eight years ago. Right. It later became the foundation for the boot camp of what we teach here at the Art of Charm, which the core is our residential programs that guys fly into LA from all over the world to learn directly from us and our Do they come live here where we're sitting? They do, yeah. That's wow. why you see these beds here and like these teaching facility, this like this weird loft come up, um, classroom. It's a cool place, though. I like I like this place. You know, the location has its ups and downs. I'm sure, sure. but it's a, it's a it's a neat unit. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's it's definitely great for what we do. I mean, there's it's one of the only neighborhoods in LA where you can walk everywhere. Right. Um, it's got restaurants. A lot of things are open. There's a lot of venues all over the place, right. um, and it's very convenient. Guys don't need a car. They can fly in from Australia, China, you know, wherever, Hong Kong, yeah. um, Canada, US, anywhere and they can crash here, they live with the coaches, they live with the other students, and as you can see, we've got this immersive classroom experience right. where there's video capabilities that, that we work with during class, there's the classroom, the whiteboard you can see painted on the wall yes. here with idea paint, um, and the guys can really learn hardcore, and best of all, you know, a lot of people go, oh, I want to learn this where I'm at, it's like, no, we're going to make you make so many mistakes right. and go so far outside your comfort zone, you don't want to do this at the place where you go every weekend. Right, you, you, want, you want to go to a complete terra incognita. Exactly. It's, the reasons you describe, you know, the, the walkability here and, and uh, the, the density, it's the same reasons I live in Koreatown, there are certain pockets of Los Angeles where you can live, like, a city life, you know, in the second largest city in America, how about that? It's, Los Angeles... God, you've got to know how to use it, don't you? You've got to know where to be. There's no right answer to, there's no perfect answer, no easy answer to where you need to go, what you need to do in the city. I mean, how, how much experience do you have here? Did you grow up anywhere near here or were you just, did you come here for Art of Charm? Uh, yeah, no, I grew up in Detroit and then I moved to Manhattan to do the finance Wall Street thing. And then after a few years there, um, left Wall Street and went, wait a minute, why am I still paying New York rent and right. dealing with winter? So we moved here for the art of charm because of the cost of doing business is lower than Manhattan. Um, there's no winter, which was always our slow season for our immersive 
boot camps and programs. Right. And then we were originally going to stay for temporary time and go back to New York. But then it was like, wait, you know what? This is pretty cool. Let's stick around for a while. Um, and so we did come here for the Art of Charm. And you're right. L.A. is one of those places where you got to know how to use it. Uh, people don't realize that L.A. is a group of other towns, cities, and neighborhoods packed together for tax purposes. Yes, exactly. They, they imagine it's like Chicago or New York and maybe downtown, which it also is just a neighborhood or, <clears throat> or area, is sort of like those places. But the rest of L.A. is a giant spread out mess. <laughs> um, and that's why when people go, oh, I live in mid-city, you kind of go, oh, I'm so sorry. Because all that means is... I live in an area that has some stuff that's between all of the other neighborhoods because right. I don't know what, like, I don't have the money to live elsewhere or, or right. don't want to or didn't know when I moved here from wherever right. that I was living. Put the pin down and just hope for the best. Yeah. And not that Hollywood's that great. Like, I would never choose to live here if it right. weren't very conducive for recording on the radio and filming on television and having these boot camps, which are all things that I do for business because it's not a great place to, like, relax. True, you know, true. Um, but K Town's interesting. I wanted to move there, but it's also not the safest part of LA, right? Admittedly so, but you know, it's. I feel like Los Angeles, wherever you are, it's its own skill set. Like if you don't, you can't really take other skills from other places and apply them to here. It just doesn't work. Like it's you re you start over when you come to Los Angeles with your living skills, right? Yeah, um, because either you're coming from a place where you didn't have to worry about safety to a place where you should a little bit, um, or you're like, oh, I, I know how to drive, but do you know how to park? Well, yeah, I parked in Manhattan, not the same thing as parking in L.A. Like, you know, finding street parking and then, like, learning how to make friends is totally a different ballgame. And that varies from neighborhood to neighborhood. Mm. K-Town making friends is going to be totally different than making friends in Hollywood, which is going to be totally different than making friends in Santa Monica. Right, right. It, it, cer it certainly will be, and it's... That's one skill you can't ignore wherever you're going, other countries, whether you're Africa to Denmark or New York to Los Angeles or whatever. You're going to have to make friends where you go, no matter what, unless you're a, like a self-sufficient shut-in, mm -hmm. and there's not really many of those. But people will often say, I mean, you've heard this a million times, I'm sure, that in Los Angeles, oh, it's so difficult to make friends, you can't do it, everyone's an asshole. In Los Angeles, you can't. everyone's out for themselves, you can't make a friend here. This is, of all the places I've been, by far the easiest place to make friends. I don't, what's your experience been? I mean, you're a master of social dynamics, so it's going to be skewed in one direction here. But what do you, what do you think about that analysis? So that, that, the sort of casual, like, ah, oh, you can't make friends here. I can. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely really easy to make friends anywhere. It's, or I should say, it, it's possible to make friends anywhere. Um, I don't think L.A. Is, is any harder than anywhere else. New York is very friendly, but has a reputation for being rude. Los Angeles isn't that unfriendly. It's just that most more people here are going to be insecure versus people that you might meet in other cities. Um, that said, one of the reasons that it's easier to make friends in a big city like this is because almost everyone's a transplant. Right. So if you go to a bar, chances are that you're, and you're from Biloxi, there's going to be a bunch of people there from Minnesota, Wyoming, Chicago, uh, one native L.A. guy who, you know, is waiting for a friend from out of town. Right, and he wants to move away. Right, and he's thinking, ugh, why am I still here? <laughs> and then three people from New York and a bunch of people from Tampa, Florida. Mm. They're not unfriendly. They just don't know what they're doing either. So right. they're not necessarily going to be outgoing as well. Right. If your strategy for making friends is sit around and wait for other people to approach you and go, hey, do you want to be friends, then you need to go back to kindergarten where that actually happens. <laughs> It's a golden advantage of Los Angeles socially that you can always say for this reason, where are you from? Like, cool, you, you can talk to anybody here because where are you from makes sense, right? It does, yeah. It's a city of transplants. And it's the same thing. Even in New York, if you say, where are you from? So you might be in, at Times Square and someone says Brooklyn. Right. That's not the same city in their mind. World, so it, World apart. Right. And, and it makes total sense. If you're um, in the village and you say, where are you from? And they say, Upper East Side. There's, that's not a weird question because it's a different part of Manhattan. Um, same thing with L.A. Uh, if you're, even if you're from L.A. and you say, where are you from? And the, the person says, West Hollywood, and you're in Hollywood. That's not a weird question um, because that's a totally different part of the city. Uh, it would be a weird question if you said, where are you from? And you were in Detroit and that person was from north of Detroit. They'd be like, Why, what do you mean, where am I from? I'm from Troy. I'm from West Bloomfield. Like, what do you mean, where am I from? Who cares? 
Did you grow up in Detroit proper, in the city itself? No, I grew up in a town called Troy, which is north of uh, Detroit. It's mm. t kind of vanilla and not that exciting. Mm. And that's one of the reasons I moved around so much. Uh, I moved as an exchange student when I was 17, and I never lived at home since then. So I've lived in like a bunch of different countries. I actually haven't counted in a while, so it's at least seven or eight different countries, um, speak a bunch of different languages, have lived in a bunch of different cities in the US. Uh, and so it's a, really a different experience. Um, and so I grew up kind of like in suburban Detroit where you're thinking, ugh, there's nothing to do. And, it's funny looking at places like this and seeing how much stuff there is to do for people who, when my age, when I was 16, 17, what we had to do was drive around in someone's car. Yeah, driving around. I, I was in a suburb of Seattle where the drive around or going to a, everything you do is an extension of some 20 screen movie theater built onto the side, right? Same deal in, in Troy? Oh yeah, it was... Drive around, I was the guy who had the car, so I was like the man, yeah, which sure. was awesome right. having the car. But then it was just Glory like, days. Glory days. <laughs> but it was like, the glory was, hey, I'm the only one with a car. So yeah. like, until everyone got a car, I was like the guy who people called, hey, we want to go out for pizza. And it's like, cool, it's Friday night, let's go eat pizza. Pretty lame. Mm -hmm. um, I would not, people go, oh man, to be a kid again. No thanks. Yes. I was bored to absolute tears most uh, days. And the younger, the worse, just because you're so limited. It's, it's the feeling of powerlessness was always so. Ugh. When I was 15, and before I had a car, when I was 16, I just remember being like, at some point, I'm gonna get in so much trouble that I'm gonna actually go to jail. Because <laughs> like, I see the cell. Oh, it was. I was so incredibly bored, and I was getting in trouble. I was. I was wiretapping, which is like not something you're supposed to do, sure. even as, especially as a kid. And that was one of the reasons I got into social dynamics, is because right. I was doing a lot of social engineering, which was like convince people that you're this when you're not because it was right. fun and it was challenging and God, conning them yeah conning them and yes. god knows i didn't have anything else to do right. and it was it was harmless i mean it was like right. hey i got a free phone call out of it by convincing the phone company operator from a payphone that i was a lineman Sweet. you know like that was the coolest thing ever because i was 15 and i rode my bike to an area that had a payphone right. um right. you know who cares <laughs> uh in in retrospect but mm. you know now it's there's so many other things going on and and really I, I should say I should count my blessings because that was what got me into social engineering and social dynamics and that was what got me bored enough to want to move to Germany as an exchange student at age 17 right. so all of that shaped the course of my life necessity but I, being the mother of invention I, I, exactly but I, man it just as easily could have turned into hey let's try these weird substances everyone is doing that's more fun than watching TV right you could be brewing you do brew meth I don't you could be you could have a you could have a meth empire at this point uh, you know that's the same level of energy but you're, you're directed it better I, I would like to think so, yeah. But a lot of my friends that I grew up with, yeah, they did turn to drugs and alcohol, right. and they're still kind of stuck in that quagmire or recovering from the mess that those things cause mm -hmm. because we didn't have anything to do. And it, it was just it just as easily could have been me, but I instead met an exchange student and was like, oh, that sounds fun, as right. opposed to like joining my friends on Coke binges every day or right. whatever they were doing. It's one of those regrets I have that as a kid I didn't do the exchange student thing, because I was equally bored, but I was uh, so socially inept that I, to come back to that point, that I couldn't bear the idea of like, oh God, what if I go, what, I can't go anyplace else, like, how, how do I talk to anybody? I can't learn another language, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't talk to people. What if people aren't interested in the same things as me, like the fears stacked up and I just yeah. didn't do it. Um, but I, I did break out of that. Uh, and I was going to add that, or I was going to, I want to provide background for the listener that um, Jordan was a guest on a podcast of a previous guest of mine, Caleb Bacon, who does the show Man School. I first heard Jordan there, and he mentioned, as he just mentioned recently, on a few minutes ago, a minute or two ago on this show, uh, the amount of traveling he's done, the uh, languages that he speaks. That intrigued me because I feel like getting into... Languages and travel was, for me, the engine of breaking the bad social habits. Were they... I don't know if you ever had bad social habits yourself, oh, but yeah. do you see how that might work? 
Well, definitely. I mean, the reason, and I definitely had bad social habits. Yeah, for sure. Because when I was so bored that I, I retreated into like nerddom and yes. like started really geeking out on like, fu I mean, what reasonable 13 year old is wiretapping? Yes. Not somebody who's really that cool in, in middle school, right? right? So then I got a computer and a modem and the internet and I was, my friends, quote unquote, were all like 20, 30 year old people and we were sharing technical specifications of electronic phone right. equipment. I mean, that was not exactly what all the kids were up to. Right. Um, I was cloning cell phones and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I mean, this is not stuff that kids my age were into. Sure. So yeah, I had terrible social habits and I was getting in trouble, big surprise. So, I mean, there's a lot of things going on there. Um, but travel's great for this because you go to another country and and, and anybody who's listening, any like white guy in Asia knows what I'm talking about right now. You go to another country and everybody's like, oh, you're interesting. And you're like, wait a minute, what? I'm interesting? Right. I was invisible where I was before. Right. Now suddenly you're the popular guy mm -hmm. wherever you are and everybody wants to talk to you and all the girls think you're handsome and you're like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. So you reinvent yourself because you're able to, but it takes you a while. And then the next place you move, you're like, okay, starting off being this cool, interesting guy that everybody like. So you start doing that and then you start getting all these social experiences and then you move again and you're like, wait a minute, right. I can do this, but I'm going to fine tune this and I'm going to become this person. Mm -hmm. So you start over again and you've grown a lot. And then, mm -hmm. so what you know, when you, when you travel abroad the first time, you might go abroad for six months to a year, you come back and all your friends are, eh, they're kind of the same. A few people have these little changes. Some people have major changes, but not that many. You, on the other hand, have aged like three to five years in terms of maturity right. because uh -huh. you've learned all this stuff about yourself, mm. right? And so you keep doing that and you keep rinse and repeat and you come back and you're like this old soul mm. because you've seen so much of the world and learned so much about yourself mm. and all your friends are like, okay, and they don't care about your trip. They don't want to hear about it. They're like, oh, oh man, how was Germany? Cool. Oh, awesome. Anyway, let's go get a beer. And you're like, wait, that's it? Like this profoundly changed my whole life and you right. like don't want to hear about it, but not everybody gets it, right? Yeah, but meanwhile, you know yourself inside and out so much more than you used to. Mm -hmm. And so you really do become so much different. Not only that, but you've reinvented yourself and you're like, you're, you're like, I'm not going back. Right, right, right. And you discovered the joys of, shall we say, being a foreigner, less traveling even than just being a foreigner uh, when you went to Germany, I, I presume, and I, as did I when I began traveling. But I... I wonder as well, you know, specifically we were talking a bit about languages. I noticed a Korean textbook before we started recording, and I, that's a language I study. And you, uh, you now speak five, you're working on a sixth. And what, what, is, what is your language status right now? Yeah, five, actually. Um, I was doing a little bit of Korean, but I just backed away from it because I thought, okay, I'm working on Mandarin right now. I don't need to confuse myself. Yes. Um, so yeah, English, German, Spanish, Serbian, and now Mandarin Chinese is where it's at for me. And, and it's funny because people go, oh, I'm bad at languages. People listening right now are going, oh, I'm bad at languages. I got all C's in French in high school. It's not, I'm not bad at languages. I'm great at languages. I'm bad at memorizing verb tables that are completely irrelevant to yes. the use of a language. Yeah, and you think, who's, who's good at that? Right. You, you don't want to know that person. Yeah, no. Who's good at that? People who are great at academics. But all those people who got A's in French, right. I'm guessing right now that they're not conversationally fluent in French. And if they are, it sure as heck is not because they memorized a verb table in middle school or high school. Right. In fact, I bet you that if you took our French teachers from high school and you plopped them down in France, French people would be like, your French is crap, no one talks like that. Right. And the guy who went there and learned just by speaking, who runs a bar, mm -hmm. is probably 10,000 times better at conversational French than your French teacher ever was. Right, you know, a Korean speaking partner I had, had this analogy, he said it's like riding a bicycle. Two guys, both of them want to ride a bike. One of them studies bicycles his whole life, gets a PhD in bicycles, knows everything, but has never gotten on a bike. The other one knows nothing about anything, but he's been riding around all those years. Right. Who's, who can ride a bike? And who can ride a bike well? You know, Who's going to be able to? Even when that PhD guy gets on the bike, he, you, you want to be both. Ideally, but if, you, if you're going to be one, you're going to be the guy who just got on the bike, right? Same with social skills. It, it is the same with social skills. It's funny. I was going to bring it back there, too. There's all these, we always joke here at The Art of Charm, uh, whenever we read these scientific studies that probably cost like a million dollars to publish in Psychology Today or wherever, because it's always like, congratulations, science is 1% closer to knowing one part of what we know here at The Art of Charm and can teach our students to apply every day. Like, there's these studies that came that come by and 
It's like, oh, people look at your body language and they use that to decide whether or not you're a good mating partner and your level of confidence. And it's like, uh, yeah, duh. Yeah. And also, we can teach you a million other things that are not documented by this study. But hey, thanks for proving that part of what we teach is now backed by science. We'll be over here using this and the other 10,000 things that you didn't study to become better. And it's, it's funny because we'll get these academic experts on the podcast or people will write to us and be like, oh, I study this area and I know everything about it. And then you meet them and you're like, you're a body language expert. Have you ever looked at the way that you're sitting, standing, walking, or talking right, with people? They're just kind of hunched over yeah. in the corner. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, so you're a body language expert, huh? Yes funny but it makes perfect sense because you look at these pickup artist guys and you're like wait a minute you teach guys how to meet girls you're so creepy right. like no girl that has any radar would ever even be in the same room with you alone let alone guy like no guy should be learning from you if anything right. you're an example of what not to do i mean i realize those pickup artist guys get girls they must but consider the girls they get you know that's you know you, you want it's all about human relations and you want to have you know, you want your friends to be psychologically healthy and interesting, and you want your girlfriends to be. It's it's no different. And those the girls are not psychologically healthy that pickup artists score with, right? Yeah. If they get girls at all, usually they're three gallons of crazy in a two-gallon bucket. Oh, jeez. Yeah. And so you really don't see a lot of... It, it's it's really obvious when you meet and talk with them that you're like, oh, that's what your stuff works on? Okay, I don't want to sign up for this anymore. So that's why we pride ourselves, at the Art of Trauma, we pride ourselves in like, hey, the girls that we're with, they're cool, they're successful, they have careers, they're good looking, they're fun, and they're nice to everyone. Right. Like, that's not a combination that you find every day. Um, and if you meet these pickup artist guys and you're like, yeah, she, I'm dating the strippers, one of the things that they always like to write about on their blogs and stuff, and I'm like, why would you brag about that? That's, I would try to hide that desperately if I were doing it. Like, I'm dating a girl. What does she do? Uh, yeah, it, because all that says is, I'm dating a girl who basically has a million things wrong with her. Right. And I'm going to advertise that because even I don't know any better. It's oh. like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I shouldn't do that. But right. you know what? Again, that pickup artist thing that attracts a certain type of guy, and usually they're not the brightest bulbs in the in the in the box. Yes, sadly, sad, sad but true. I want to go a little back to the language thing because, mm -hmm. tell me your experience when you was was German the first language you learned learned. I mean, beyond the seas in high school French. Okay, so you go to Germany. How how well versed in German? I mean, you can only be so good at German before you go. Did you know any? No, I didn't know any, and. I got there being like, uh, I guess I'm going to try to learn this, but, you know, they say everyone speaks English, so I'll probably get by on that, and, like, right. maybe I'll be able to understand some by the time I leave. Hmm. Well, fail. What happened was um, I got there, and uh, it, it's so funny looking back on how just ignorant I was. I got there, and I was in the former East Germany, so I was like, right. what the heck? This doesn't look like the pictures. Like, what's going on here? What do you mean you used to be communist until 10 oh, years ago? Like, You're not really flying blind. Yeah, I mean, it was 1997, and I'm in right. former East Germany, right. and I'm, like, deep in there. I'm not, like, on the border. I'm not in a big city that they decided to remodel the whole thing. I'm in a place that, like, didn't get a whole lot of love, mm. aside from them renaming the streets from, like, Karl Marxstrasse to, like, you know, pair away, yes. you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and... So I was really kind of like, wait a minute, how come everyone speaks Russian? Oh, sure. And, and like, their accent's different. Like, what the heck is going on? Mm -hmm. So I went to school, and English class was, like, seven or eight years old. And that was it. So even the English teachers, sometimes I had no idea what the hell they were saying. Oh, I see. And there were a couple that were really good. They, like, lived in the U.K., and they were really, you know, solid. But even then, a lot of it was like, we're going to learn about Jared. Oh, and, yes. and I'm like, what the heck is that? And then I remember like my friends being super confused and being like, Jarens are hard. And I'm like, just add ing. Yeah. And it means it's you're not doing that it bad, now. guys. Yeah. And they're like, wait, what? Why didn't they just say that? And I'm like, because your teacher's a million years old. <laughs> you know. And it's like, that's why. And it's not that hard. So all of my friends had this awesome conversational English teacher, and they were trying to teach me German, and it was really hard. And I was taking these German lessons, and those were really hard. And then eventually. It all was about mindset for me, which right. is kind of not not unusual because that's what it's about for everything. And it just took me a while to learn it when I was there because I was like, this sucks. This place sucks. Everyone sucks. And I'm not going to learn. And then once I was like, I have a choice. I can go home defeated. Not going to happen. 
or I can just learn German. And once I learn German, I think I'm going to have a much easier time here. So I just started to pay attention and I started to try to speak and I started to look up words and I started to like fight through it and like watch TV and try to understand what's going on and have conversations with my host family. And once I started to do that, my German went from, I'm not learning this because I don't want to, to, I had the best German of any exchange student. And I was one of the only ones that had no German experience when I got there. So there were people who had taken four, five, six, ten years of German. And I remember coming to a retreat like three or four months in and they were like, my German's improving and I love it here and I'm partying and everyone's so cool. And I was like, I'm not doing any of that. Six months in, they were all homesick. The party, the fun, the newness had stopped. A lot of them had stopped learning German. They hated it. A lot of them were depressed. I, on the other hand, was like, now this is cool because now I understand German. And it was funny because 10 months in, we had another like reunion. My German was better than the guy who had been taking it for 10 years. And man, was he pissed because he decided, oh, I already know German. And so I'm not going to be friendly or nice to everybody. And it, it just really came down to me being like, I want to go over to everyone's house. I want to be friends with everybody. I want to play with everybody. I want to go out with everybody. I want to play on every sports team. I want to do everything. And they were just, like the other exchange students just weren't doing that. So my mindset was sponge. Right. Their mindset was, I already know what I'm doing. I don't need help with this. Yeah, there's nothing more dangerous than I know what I'm doing, right? In any context. Reminds me of this TV show Sledgehammer from back in like the 90s where he's like, trust me, I know what I'm doing. And he's like this this moron cop who like always stumbled into the solution oh, wow. um, and he had a magnum and he would shoot everything. That was his answer to every problem. Um, and that was very common. And it was like, that's, I went in there just as stubborn, but then I was like, you know what? I can continue beating my head against the wall. Um, or I can decide that maybe there's a better way to do this mm. and figure it out. Now, from, from your experience and from many, from many others, you know, we can infer that being, social in a foreign country will improve your language more than anything else. But it also strikes me that learning another language improves your social abilities in and of itself. Like if I'm speaking Spanish, it was still still pretty broken for me, but I can do it. Or Korean, which I'm bad at, but working on. Or Japanese, which is barely functional. I'm definitely more social than English because the rules change, don't they? Like I, if I'm talking to a native Spanish speaker, a lot of the time I'm going to be asking them about the language itself or basic things, things that seem too basic to talk about in English, but that lead to fruitful conversations in other languages because like your own rules change, right? You, what you, what you let yourself talk about. It was that, was that your experience at all? Yeah, definitely. And that's a, that's an interesting point. It's totally true. Um, for example, it might be, and this is just a very common example that comes from my own, um, my own job here, my own career. You can, if you go to some place in the United States as an American, you can't quote unquote in, in air quotes because you can totally, and I we teach it all the time. But you can't quote unquote start a conversation with a total stranger without it being a little socially awkward. Mm. If you're a foreigner, yeah. you can do whatever the heck you want. And everyone thinks it's cute, right? Doors fly open. Doors fly open, and it would be weird if I said, "Oh, hey, can I go to work with you tomorrow?" You'd be like, <laughs> "No, what the heck are you talking about?" But right. if I'm foreign. And I go, hey, can I come see your job sometime? You'd be like, oh, sure. In case in point, um, I had a bunch of a couple of Saudi friends here from Mecca visiting me in L.A. And they were like, can we see the police? And I was like, I don't think so, but I'll ask. So I called the cops. I called LAPD and said, can I bring a couple friends in and see what you do? And they were like, uh, no, we don't do that. That's weird. Why would you ask? Who are you? What's your name, phone number, and address? Because they thought that was weird. And I said, well, I'm here. here's all this information. I've got a couple friends from Saudi Arabia, and they're curious. And the guy goes, oh, from Saudi Arabia? What are they doing here? And I was like, oh, they're just tourists, and they just asked to see the police. And I thought that was kind of weird, but it makes sense. And they go, you know what? Come down to the police station. We don't really give tours, but like, we'll drive them around in the car. Like, whatever. So we went and we went and saw the police and we got handcuffed and we like flipped the siren and got to drive the car around and it was really cool right. and I was like you know what there's no way if I just came down with like my cousin from the United States that this would have ever happen yes. sure the same thing happens when you go overseas you can go and I did I went to go see the police station and I went to the police chief and you know I was able to start conversations with all kinds of people and ask really dumb questions and, and go up to the cool kids in class and go, hey, can I come to your party? And everyone went, oh my God, he just invited himself to a party. And they would be like, yeah, totally, man. And you know, you can go and ask to play a sport. I, I played 
a sport. Uh, when I was in East Germany, I played a sport called Sitzball or something like that, where all these people, literally, not even kidding, all these people with no legs played volleyball, and I it's played with them, vision. and I wasn't allowed to use my legs. That was the only rule. I just couldn't use my legs. Right. And it was amazing because, I one, I'm terrible at volleyball, but I wasn't bad at right. this sitting game because you don't have to like run and dive because mm. none of these other people are doing it. You don't have right, any legs. Right, right. But exactly. it was super fun. I mean, it was it was it was fun, mm. and I would never have done that around here. Mm. Um, and you can ask, you can break rules. Societal rules don't apply to you because you're this foreign guy. You're allowed to be weird. So you're, I was one of the things that I learned was I'm allowed to walk up to cute girls and be like, "Hey, can I come to your birthday party?" <laughs> and she'd be like, uh, "I don't know you, but okay, because you're weird and foreign, and I don't want to say no." And I made a ton of friends that way. Yes. Because I would just walk up and go, hey, can I do that thing you're doing right now? <laughs> and people in the street would be like, uh, I guess, hey, uh, if you want to do this other thing I'm doing, like, give me a call. <laughs> and that happened all the time. It's, we might say that when you're a foreigner, everything is a potential cultural exchange. You know, we mentioned the question, what can I learn from this person? Well, it's made obvious when you're a foreigner. You can exchange not cultural information necessarily, but, you know, the, there's... There's a lot you can learn from each other by that very by the nature of, of of where you're from and how you're interacting, and that's one of the things that's I think a strong quality of Los Angeles is everyone's a foreigner. So you know, learning Korean, for example, um, when when this one Korean family that I met noticed I was studying hard, they said, "Why don't you come over every week to our home and we'll teach you Korean and teach you about Korea uh, for a few hours every week?" And it's like, oh, cool that there's no precedent for this in my life in America, but it's the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, it totally is. And that's a really cool offer that you totally should take them up on. Yeah, so I took it up on. I I was there Sunday. Yeah, I mean, that's that's so cool, right? And and that kind of thing happens a lot when you travel. People go, oh, you're foreign? You have to come over for dinner. You have to come over for this. You have to come over for this holiday. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're foreign and you're here like over a ho Oh, you're definitely coming with us on vacation. You're definitely coming with us to do this thing. You're definitely coming to visit my family over here. And it, And it's not weird. It would be super weird if you were like, hey, come over for Christmas. I'd be like, uh, that's weird. We just met. But right. if I was from Saudi Arabia and you said, hey, come over for Christmas, I'd be like, awesome. Right. And nobody would think that's weird. Mm. So being a foreigner is a huge advantage. Mm. But most people think that they're at a disadvantage. And it's again, it's all mindset shift. Mm. And you're right. Everybody in L.A. is foreign. It's, if you're alone on Thanksgiving and you live in L.A. You, and your family doesn't, it's not weird to go, Hey man, um, can I pop by your place? I really don't have any plans. Right. Nobody's right. gonna go. Can you believe this jerk from Michigan invited himself <laughs> over for Thanksgiving? Yes, yes. Things work differently. Your Los yeah. Angeles tips for you listeners who are considering coming. We mentioned the word networking before. That has become a, a kind of a dirty word, I guess. Net to network. You know, think of in Los Angeles, oh, the industry, just guys handing out their cards and looking for looking for a producer for their half baked project, things like that. Um, I, you know, a couple of friends of mine sometimes ask me, Colin, you, know, you seem to be good at knowing people. How do I network? How do I network? Like they say network as if it's something like, uh, I shouldn't want to do this, but I know I have to. And it's like, uh, you're crediting me with the skill that you don't really want to have with the community. But I understand them, uh, because what, what, when someone asks, how do I network? They're not asking, how do I be a sleazy guy? They're not asking, how do I hand my cards out at parties and seem really self-serving? What do you think they're asking? What people are asking is, how do I develop relationships? Right. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, again, are, are going, what's in it? The reason people are afraid of networking is because they are going, oh, I don't want to ask what's in it for me all the time, and I don't want to sell myself. But here's the thing. When you shift your mindset about what networking is, and you turn it into, what can I do to help other people? It's so powerful, because no one goes, oh man, I'm gonna feel like such a jerk trying to help all these people. Right. You're not going to, in fact, and few people are gonna turn you away. Mm -hmm. So if somebody, when I network, for example, in my for the art of charm or for myself personally or for anything, I think, what can I do to help this other person? So right. I might reach out to a journalist at NPR and go, hey, you know, we met at this conference in Vegas and I know you interviewed my friend about this computer security thing. I've got a couple of people that I know that are really interesting, don't know if it's up your alley, here's an intro to some of their work. Mm. If you're interested, let me know and I'll introduce you to them. Right. So then I would make an in, in email introduction to the person, 
And they go, cool. Uh, Jordan, I also saw that you're doing something pretty interesting. Hey, yeah, I am. If you're interested, let me know. I'd love to talk to you more about what I do. I don't go, hey, journalist, can you write a story about me? Because they go, get out of here. I get enough of this crap every day. Right, right. Pitch it, send it to pitch garbage folder at npr.org, sure, right? Sure, but, circular file. Yeah. But if I'm constantly sending them things that help them out, they go, hey, you know what? I've got a friend who's writing a story about dating. Can I put her in touch with you? Awesome. Now I'm an NPR, mm-hmm. right? Um, but that's not me asking for anything. And it's not even me hoping that one day this works out for me. Right. Because what's, what I've done with the NPR girl here before I get interviewed, right? But when I'm sending her interest stories, mm-hmm. I'm helping her find stories. She's a journalist. That's exactly – I'm saving her a bunch of work. Mm-hmm. When, I, when my friend goes, wait a minute, Jordan, you just hooked me up with this chick from NPR. You're right. awesome. Right. I go, yeah, man, Cool. By the way, who did that video I saw of you? It's done well. He goes, my video guy, here's his info. Mm. Now I'm hiring a video guy. That guy's thankful. My friend's thankful because he got an NPR story. Video guy's thankful because he got a referral to a job. Now everyone's happy. Now, if my video guy needs more work, I'm probably going to send him to a bunch of other people because people are asking me who did my video. Right. Now, my buddy who got interviewed on NPR owes me a solid, and the journalist from NPR owes me a solid. So by constantly helping people out, people are constantly looking out for ways they can repay me, right. and now I've got things flying at me. I don't even know how to handle all the opportunities. That's networking. Right. It's, you bring up something important, which is that it's a point I only realized was true a few years ago myself, which is networking, the good version, is also... It's not necessarily about you talking to someone directly. It's it, it's many times about you connecting to other people. You're merely a third party, or so it seems, right? Yeah, yeah, you're merely a third party. And that's the thing is a lot of people who are young entrepreneurs, and, and when I do entrepreneurial-based shows, people ask me this all the time. Hmm. They're like, oh, well, I don't have a bunch of money, and oh, my, my project isn't big enough. I don't have a big audience. I don't have any value to give. Well, wait a minute. You're spending all this time going out and meeting people. You've got a huge Rolodex of people that – don't want anything from you because you have nothing to offer, quote unquote. But what happens when a kid with nothing but time who's starting a business is going out and meeting a hundred people a month? Mm. He's got a Rolodex and he knows what everybody in that network is looking for. Right. That guy is so freaking valuable. Mm. Because now that kid who met me and knows that, man, I just can't find a video guy and I don't have time to look for one, just went out and met 20 video guys mm. at a conference. And those guys are looking for work. Mm -hmm. Well, the kid doesn't have any money to hire them. It doesn't have any video projects. But he knows that me and three other entrepreneurs are looking for video guys. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? All he needs to do is send an email. Now I now I owe that kid one, and the video guys owe that kid one. Right. That's that karma is going to start to add up after a while. Mm -hmm. You can't not succeed with that kind of positive influx. You have to, your goal has to be simply your goal has to be simple though connect to as connect to people as many as I can as well as I can it can't be like I've got to go out and find a girlfriend or I've got to go and find a guy who shoots with this kind of camera who can make me this video specificity is act, it hurts you right it's the enemy specificity is the enemy and that's the thing that's what people do wrong in in any networking environment they go okay I'm a screenwriter and I need to find somebody who's going to back my crap. So then they come up and they go to this meetup and I'm there and and they go, hey, what do you do, Jordan? I go, oh, well, you know, I'm a talk show host on the radio and I teach men how to do. And then he just walks away because I'm not what he's looking for. (laughs) Yeah. Right. He came to the store for a certain cam. You're not that cam. So he's going to go to get the peas or whatever. Right. So he's gone and I go, hmm, that guy kind of was a dick. Right. (laughs) And, And then... I'm walking around, and then meanwhile, I've got a bunch of friends who maybe are looking to buy screenplays or back this, or I've got movie connections, but he'll never know because he didn't bother finishing his conversation with me because, gee, I just wasn't what he needed at the time. Right. He didn't, he didn't want – he could have just gotten knowledge from you. You can get knowledge from anybody, as we've said, but he didn't want that. He wanted something very specific, and now he can't – you can't make anything happen like that, you know? Exactly. Yeah, I can't make anything happen like that. And, you know, he just, he, he was looking for something su- super specific. And we see it all the time in dating. You know, guys go, I like girls that look like this and have this and have that and have this and then have that. And then the one time in 10 years when they actually do meet that person, that person goes, yeah, you know what? I met that guy, but he sucked. He didn't have any dating experience. Well, gee, I wonder why. 
Jeez, it's, it's to go back to the issue of the finding a girlfriend thing. You know, it's something as you know, a lot of guys talk about aloud. How do I get a girlfriend? Or I haven't had a girlfriend so long. Girlfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend. And I, I am not a professional in giving advice on that. I'm not even particularly like. I, I have no complaints about uh, about anything girlfriend related in my life or in the past, really. But if friends ask, you know, you know, what do you think I should do to, to meet a girlfriend? It's it's sort of like all I can say is. Uh, don't don't look for one. Don't look, don't look for, for one. Like I describe, this is what I say. Tell me in your professional opinion if this is a good thing to say. But people people are vectors to things in life. You know, know as many people as possible. They are vectors to things. Maybe girlfriends, maybe not. But so a guy who gets high quality girlfriends, uh, he's not a guy with no friends. You know what I mean? He's not a guy who doesn't know anybody, doesn't do anything. Right. No, people who have high quality girlfriends are people that have their proverbial stuff together in every other area of their life most of the time. Right. Um, you might look at a guy and go, well, so-and-so is a schlep and he's got a great girlfriend. No, he doesn't. He has a girlfriend that's one to put up with a schlep. That's, there's something wrong there. You just don't know what it is. Right. Right. Um, People are attracted to healthy, li- good quality, healthy women are attracted to people with good quality, healthy lifestyles. Mm. Um, if you're looking for a girlfriend, you're not really looking for a girlfriend. You're looking for someone to bandage a hole in your ego or mm. a hole in your heart or a hole in your life or something that you're missing. Mm. Nobody wants to be that for you for very long mm. um, unless they've got issues right. and you don't want that. Um, you don't want the baggage that comes with that. Mm. You will find a girlfriend when you're, you've got your sense of purpose is on track, your career is, is starting to take shape. You don't have to be successful mm. to get, uh, you know, financially to get a good girlfriend. You just have to have stuff together. You have to be confident. You have to, and, and again, don't, you know, be taller. Uh, right. You have to have your stuff together you have to like I discovered my girlfriend when I was very happy just as happy being alone um, but had a lot to offer um, and that was hey listen I've got a great career I've got a great business I've got a great lifestyle I have a great circle of friends hey who wants to be a part of that a lot of people are gonna raise their proverbial hand and volunteer for that if you go well, I'm really bored, I'm really lonely, I really, really, really want a girlfriend, who wants to join me in my pit of loneliness and despair? There's going to be people who volunteer for that, but they're not the people you want to be stuck with. God, have I, have I known guys like that? Here in Los Angeles, you know, you'll hear this complaint so often, especially in the industry, uh, it's all who you know, it's all who you know, it's all who you know. In any industry, people will just bitch and moan, it's all who you know, it's all who you know. I don't think they're wrong to say it's all who you know, but... They probably are wrong to complain about it, and this is what I say to them. Maybe this is too harsh. Give me, give me your evaluation. But if if your complaint is it's all who you know, your problems go beyond not having skills. If you think you can't know anybody, like that's a deep problem. You have a very bad problem if you think it's all that should you should be happy. You should say, oh, it's all who you know. Great, yeah. right? Absolutely. I, I love that you just said that because I just talked about this on my show today. It is all about who you know, and thank God for that yes. because. That means you don't have to wor- work on being like the number one software engineer in the world. Right. To so, get so the hand of God can lift you and put you in your proper place. Right, yeah. Like if you're a Java coder or like you're a video maker, mm. man, to be the number one video guy in the world, base, I mean, one, impossible, but like, right. man, you're going to be like the next... I don't even know who would be big in that. Like, you're the best cameraman in the world, and that's what you need to do to get a job working with uh, James Cameron? No. Right. No, you don't. You need to be functional at that job right. and network your butt off, which is a lot easier than becoming the best cameraman or the best producer or the best sound guy. Right. You don't you know, you know, don't have to be... If you're into music and you want to score mu- movies, you don't have to be the next Hans Zimmer. Right. You don't have to do that at all. You have to know how to score a movie and then work your butt off on your social skill set, which is a lot easier than becoming the next Hans Zimmer. There's <laughs> not... There's not things are. Yes. There's not that many there's not that much room at the top when it comes to each of these skill sets there's a ton of room to learn how to meet the right people and develop relationships with them one of the wisest forms of counsel i ever heard from one parent from a parent to a kid was a friend's dad saying to him if you ever look for a job in the want ads i will disown you uh because then he explained you know put your ear to the ground that's how you find work you don't find work by seeing who's so desperate they need to put an ad out to say please i need to hire somebody and i've 
I have to sort of psychologically put myself in, in that thought experiment. Like if I was running a business and I wanted to hire somebody, of course I don't want to field responses to an ad. I want to go through the grapevine at all costs. Like I want to talk to the people I know who are the smartest and ask who do you know. You run a business. Is that something you've learned here? Yeah. I mean, we've never reached out in any traditional f fashion to sort of like hire people. In fact, jobs that we didn't know we had were created by people who went, hey, guess what, man? You probably could use this, 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 and this. And look, I've got an idea of how this would work. Do you want me to do the first part for you for free? That's how people get hired here, right? Like our one of our um, app designers went, hey, you guys should have an app. It would look like this, it would look like that, and it would have this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. And I'll create it, but here's what I kind of want in return. And I went, yeah, man, that sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. Let me know what you need from me. That person creates an awesome product for us, gets what they want. I'm not going to go, gee, I really want an app that does this. Maybe I should post on the boards where all the scammers go to oh, scam people out of money and hire yes. ads. No, I'm not going to do that, you know. Yes. And and somebody who wants to design something for us or help us create something, they pitch us. I go, "Hmm, maybe that would be useful." Right. And then they sell me on the idea. And I and then they do it and I go, "Man, how did I live without this person before?" Right, right. It's 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 something you realize that over time, and I wonder, running this business, bringing in people, I assume from all over the world, students, uh, uh, students is the right term, right? I think they, they come here, they learn from the art of charm, from you, from others who work for you. Uh, finally, I want to know what, uh, what, what do you learn from them, the people who come from far and wide to hear Hollywood, to, to learn what you have to offer? I mean, I guess it's kind of like, what don't I learn? I mean, the guys that come through the art of charm are all highly successful in most other areas of their life. I mean, sure, we get some like college guys who are sort of fresh, um, but we get a lot of experts in here from real estate to entrepreneurship to military. So everybody comes in with a very unique life perspective, um, a lot of life experience that obviously we, we share and some that we don't, a lot that we don't. Um, and they're very smart and they're all ambitious. So it's really cool to be surrounded by these people all the time. And most of my friends I've met in some way or another through my business or the, or the show itself, mm -hmm. um, the Pickup Podcast and the Art of Charm Podcast, because those are the people that go, it, it's, it's really cool to have these like-minded people writing in and like, mm -hmm. hey, I want to fly in from Australia and take this program and do this. And then they're like, hey, if you ever want to do this random thing, you know, a skydiving instructor might come in and I go, I want to do that. Right. You know, and so now I'm skydiving with a with a AOC client, um, or a guy from, might come up from Brazil and go, "Hey, you should come down for the World Cup." Well, actually, that sounds pretty awesome. Maybe I will. You know, um, so it's really, really a fun. Uh, it's it's the coolest thing I've ever done, and I'm so glad that I do it. I mean, it, I didn't get a lot of fan mail as an attorney on Wall Street. And no doubt. So quite uh, the opposite, I'm sure. Yeah, pretty much the opposite, and yes. and so I get so so much out of the clients coming here and it's really cool to teach somebody something here at a boot camp, change their life and then have them write you a couple years later and be like, or a couple weeks later and be like, hey, I got a promotion at work. Oh, hey, I met a girl and I'm going to get married or like, hey, I got married and I have a kid now thanks to the art of charm. It's like, wow, that's pretty damn cool. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no better uh, no better compliment than actual results someone just got. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've been speaking with Jordan Harbinger. He's the co-founder of The Art of Charm. He is the co-host of the Pickup Podcast. And North Korea. What do you want to say about North Korea tours? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I've been to North Korea three times. Um, I run tours there. I bring a lot of groups of Art of Charm alumni and other friends there. Um, I've actually got a website how to go to North Korea.com and uh, guys, you know, will Google that and be like, I want to go do that. And they'll come along and we run tours all, all the time during the year. Um, and we see the mass games, which are those things you see on YouTube, those huge performances, uh, a lot of monuments. It's really cool. It's very safe. It's probably actually safer than any other place you can go because there is no crime. Um, there's just no crime. Um, and it's, it's really a lot of fun. It's super interesting. So if you're one of those guys who's traveled a lot and gone, I've seen it all, come to North Korea with us and check it out. I've studied Korean, but geez, those nor that northern accent, I still have a hard time with. I'll study harder one day. Jordan, thanks so much. Thank you very much. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with all the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. 
Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, John Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themistoclus Eucrucius, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilnbrand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadeusz Andre Kudlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, Sean McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Montz, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nullman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Ian Plosker, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Interberger, Matt Warren, Nick Weigelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright. 